Hello and welcome to this walkthrough clip of question 3 and question 4 from the 2003 Round 1 Chemistry Olympiad paper from the UK competition. I'd like to point out that it's not an official mark scheme, nor has it been endorsed by the Royal Society of Chemistry. It's just my own personal take on how you might go about answering these questions. So it says at the top that the first question is about green chemistry. Green chemistry is essentially um, the idea of how we use chemistry in a strategic way to minimise um, impacts or negative impacts on the environment. Uh, obviously the, the text of the question uh, sort of pertains to that as well. So to try and analyse how environmentally friendly um, essentially reaction might be, we use the idea of percentage atom economy. Now RMM obviously stands for relative molecular mass. So because this is from a slightly older paper, what we normally talk about now is MR, or molar mass. So it's interesting, it says it's your desired product. The desired product is the thing you're wanting to make. Now is, as is the case in many chemical reactions, this might not necessarily be the only product that you make. You might make other products as well, like side products or waste products. The more waste products you make, the more of an environmental problem you've got because you've got to do something with them. You've got to dispose of them responsibly. You can't just chuck them in the bin or wash them down the sink. You've got to think about the effect they're going to have on the environment. And if you're a chemical engineer or an industrial chemist, that idea will cost money. So you have to try and justify what type of reaction you're going to do to the people who are funding you. The CEO, for example, chief executive officer of the chemical company will want to know why am I paying you to dispose of half the stuff that, you're, that I'm buying to make the reaction work. So the atom economy is essentially how many of the atoms that you start with in your reactants actually end up in the product that you want. So first of all, it's worth pointing out that addition reactions are always 100% atom economy. No waste products are made. And it's also worth thinking about how you can increase atom economy by finding a way of selling or using waste products so they then become useful. They don't just get thrown away and have to be dealt with. So I'm not going to read through the text because clearly you can do that whilst you're watching this clip. What I'm going to do is have a look at the first question. So it says a balanced equation for the overall reaction. So what that means is what is actually ending up being produced. So if you think about it carefully and look at the two equations, you'll see that some things are produced in the first step but then used up in the second. So for example, chloroethanol is produced in the first step and used up in the second. So that means you can actually cancel this out. And you'll notice you can do the same with HCl. So now what we can do is we can combine all the reactants that are left with all the products that are left. So this allows us to write out our balanced equation. Now obviously it's becoming clear, isn't it, that we're running out of space. So I'm going to need to make the page a little bit smaller so I can do my workings on the right hand side because the next thing is to calculate the percentage atom economy for this process. So to do this, we need the MR of C2H4O divided by the total MR of all the products. So if we open up the calculation like that, you can see where all the numbers come from. Now what's really interesting at this point is I've just realised I've missed something out. Because if you look carefully on the uh, reactants and the products I've circled in red, there's two H2Os on the product side and there's one H2O on the reactant side. So I've gone back and I've crossed that out. I was going to go back and redo that part of the clip but I thought why, why, did, why not just leave it in because it shows how you can go back and self-correct during a, a Cambridge Chemistry Challenge or a Chemistry Olympiad style question. So I'm just going to go back to my calculation 
I've just changed everything around now, so there's only one 18 in the denominator. So it should be 44 over 173. Times that by 100. And you get 25.43%. So a little piece of advice that uh, I want to give now. I've made that mistake publicly. Okay, so let's move on. Um, the modern petrochemical route involves the following reaction. C2H4 plus a half O2 with uh, silver as a catalyst, um, making C2H4. Oh, it looks a lot more straightforward, doesn't it? So I'm going to make the page back up to full size again. If we look at this version, there's only one product, so there's always going to be 100% atom um, efficiency. So this doesn't really need to be calculated at all. It could just be introduced. So let's move the page down a bit now. So ibuprofen was first synthesized by Boots in a six-step process with only an atom economy of 40%. And then there's other companies that started to get in the act and start new, developing new methods, maybe with better um, atom economies. And the BHC company synthesis, which proved quite good, is shown on this page. So step one involves the use of ethanoic anhydride. So they want you to, to calculate the percentage atom economy of the BHC company process. So to do this one, we have to work out um, the molecular formula of ibuprofen so we can get its MR. So then what we need to do is look at are there any other products. Now although they don't, they don't print the ethanoic anhydride um, on the end of the equation, you can see that the arrow clearly shows that it comes off as a product. So that's going to be one of the things you have to think about. So that's the calculation we've got to do. So if we put the numbers in, that gives us 77.44%. So we now look at the hydrogen fluoride, where it asks you to state the purpose of the HF in step one. You need to think really carefully here. Does HF appear anywhere, or does fluorine appear anywhere on the right-hand side? So looking carefully at it, you can see clearly that there isn't. So what this must mean is that hydrogen fluoride is a catalyst. It's regenerated, so it's cancelled out of the overall equation. Now, if we reuse the ethanoic acid in some way, then that means that it's now become a useful product, or a desired product. Now, seeing as it was the only um, waste product in the previous um, way of looking at the reaction, if we now use it somehow, the reaction now has a 100% atom economy, so we're using a waste product that we talked about at the beginning. OK, so let's now move on to the next question. So this question is about redox equations, and it might be if you're watching this as a first year, you won't have come across how to balance redox half equations. So all the half equation is there to do is to show either the reduction half or the oxidation half. So let's take an example. So if you have a sodium reacting with fluorine, and we, in, and we put in the oxidation number, you can clearly see that you've got oxidation and reduction taking place. So that simple example shows how you can cancel out the electrons and you can get an overall equation, which can obviously be scaled up to make sure you've got an actual fluorine molecule like that. So a very straightforward way of doing this is simply to take the two halves, cancel the electrons and join them together. So if we now look at the questions, now copper 2 sulfate, they expect you to know that this is blue. You've come across it enough times. So if it's decolorizing copper 2 sulfate, it must mean the Cu2 plus ions are used up. So 
Zinc is more reactive than copper, so it must be a displacement. So we can split this reaction into two halves. So if the more reactive metal gains electrons and the less reactive metal loses them, that must mean we have redox. So you can probably see where this is going. We're simply combining the left and the right. Pretty much like that. So the next one we can speed it up a little bit. So we've got our, our chlorine and our sodium bromide and making sodium chloride and bromine. So we start by doing an ionic equation and cancelling the ions that uh, turn up on each side. So that's our sodium, isn't it? So that gives us our possible reaction. So your clue is that the sentence said that the solution turned orange. We know that bromine is orange, so that means we can put that in as our, as our reaction. And the next one we can be quite quick about as well. Magnesium ribbon reacting with dilute hydrochloric acid. Now this one's quite easy as well, isn't it? Because you can clearly predict now that you'd get a, two chloride ions on the left and two chloride ions on the right, which you'd get rid of, which means you can put that in as your equation. So let's now do D. D is where it's getting a bit more complicated. So you have manganese 4 oxide uh, reacting with concentrated HCl, which is a yellow green gas in a solution of manganese 2 chloride. Taking that information, we can probably write down the formula for each thing. We're all balanced equation now. We need to think along the same lines as we did before. And by considering state symbols, we can now guess what is uh, turned into ions and what stays as uh, what it is. So looking at what's, uh, what stays the same, you can see it's the chlorides, except the number of them slightly changes. So you can cancel out two of them, and that now gives you this overall equation. You can see that I've tied some of the ones up at the top as well. I just need to move them around a little bit, just to make it a bit clearer. Like that, there you go. So, moving on to the next one. Uh, sodium sulfate 4, decolorizing an acidified solution of potassium manganate 7. Now what that acidified means is that you have H plus ions present to make the um, reaction work. This introduces a slight extra layer of complication. So that means we're starting with uh, manganese, um, sorry, manganate 7, that's this particular ion here, MnO4 minus, and we're adding acid to it. So this is a half equation we're doing here. And because we have four oxygens, that means we've got four H2Os. Now that in itself means we must need 8H plus to make this work. So the oxygens have gone, so that must mean we now have Mn2 plus. So the thing to do now is to work out what's happening with the electrons. So we have to do oxidation states again. So we assign manganese as plus 7, Mn2 plus is plus 2, because it's the same charge as the ion. That obviously means it's been reduced, and to get from plus 7 to plus 2, you need to gain 5 electrons. So if we now consider the sulfate 4 ion, uh, that means that sulfur is in plus 4 oxidation state. Where might it get that extra oxygen from as it turns into SO4 2 minus from SO3 2 minus? Well, you can always use a water, couldn't you? Now, obviously that means you've got two hydrogens. Does that produce hydrogen gas? Well, probably not. It could produce that, couldn't it? So we've got to think about now is what sort of electrons uh, exchange is going on here. So if the other one was a reduction, this must be an oxidation. So going from plus four to plus six, it must mean it loses two electrons on the right-hand side there. Now to make the electrons cancel, you've got to have the lowest common multiple. So you've got five electrons on one side, two electrons in the other. So if you multiply the top one by um, two, like that, and the bottom one by five, like that, you can now cancel the electrons out, like so. 
Now, if you look at the hydrogens, the H pluses, you can see that the 16 and the 10 will cancel. So you've actually got six H pluses in the top reaction and no H pluses in the bottom. So let's tidy this up a little bit now. I also did a little bit of um, cancellation similarly with the water as well. Because there was one water on one side and there were four waters on the other, so I cancelled one of them out to make three on the right hand side. So now we've got the remaining ones. Um, I'm not going to go through F and G in, um, in as much detail. Um, I am going to, however, point out where the clues are. So when an ultracidified potassium dichromate, 6, goes green, it, it turns into green Cr3+. I'm going to leave that one there if you have to think about. And we've already talked about um, acidified potassium manganate uh, 7. So we know what that means. Um, but ethane dioate actually becomes two lots of carbon dioxide gas. So at the bottom of the screen what I've put is a couple of tips to use to help you work these remaining two out. Um, I'm actually not going to do them. I think it's best maybe to leave you to have a think about these. Uh, but you always use H2O to balance H plus in acidified redox reactions. And you multiply up half equations to make sure the electrons can be cancelled each side. So I think the last two would be good for you to go away and have a scribble about. And you can always look at the mark scheme on the Royal Society of Chemistry website. Which you can easily find by putting RSC Chemistry Olympiad past papers into a search engine. And it'll take you straight there. Um, so why not get it straight from the source and double check um, if you agree with my workings and if your own workings are the right ones as well. Okay, so thanks for your time on this one. Thanks for listening. Thanks for, for giving this a go. Um, so until next time, I'll see you soon.